Oh, good morning once again. Very good to see you all. Good to see so many here, uh, even on a super cold day, right? Just keep reminding yourself, our God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. Right? Does that help? <laughs> our Jesus is so great. He's so kind. He's been very kind to me. I get a little choked sometimes thinking about him. We sung the song just now that he died for us. But friends, he didn't just die for us. He lives. He ever lives to make intercession for the saints. It's not like he did one good thing for you and then there I'm done and wash his hands. He's continually doing good to us. Continually. Continually extending love towards us, grace, mercy, making intercession for us, preparing a place for us, he said. These are wonderful things to reflect on. I thank God in his wisdom that he's sort of ordained this thing called the body and bride of Christ, the church, the local church, to come together regularly to reflect on these things. The world wants to pull our attention in a million different places onto things that are infinitely of lesser value. It's good to come Come aside, like the Lord said to his disciples, let's come aside and let's rest a while and let's set our hearts and our minds on things that are really important, things that really matter, and things that you're supposed to take with you, things I'm supposed to take with me. We walk through this difficult life. God has given us his spirit and he's given us his word and these are a comfort to us. We have wonderful promises about what, Je what Jesus did and what he's going to do, what he's doing for us even now. Wonderful truths. I count myself very blessed by God. Not only to have a Bible, to open up a Bible and to read his heart on the matter, but to be trusted to stand in front of a pulpit and attempt to teach it. Please pray for your pastor. I take this very seriously. Fallen, frail man that I am. We were thinking about Moses. And Moses, the great deliverer, brought the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt and brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai in the desert. And at Mount Sinai, he was given the law. Remember the law. We looked at the law distilled into ten commandments. And we looked at those commandments. And we said that the whole law, it kind of had three aspects to it. You remember what the aspects were? We had moral aspects of that Mosaic law. And we had ceremonial aspects. And we had civil aspects. And last week, we looked at some of those civil aspects. These are uh, rules and regulations to what kind of keep order in Israel as they wandered through the desert. There were some, some rather strange conventions, too. Remember, that a person could sell themselves into servanthood. And we looked at some of that. It's kind of strange, some of those things. What we want to focus in this morning under God is the ceremonial aspects of the law. Uh, the ceremonial aspects, and we want to look at... Um, chapter 25 of Exodus. You don't have to turn there just yet, though. But in chapter 25, in the book of Exodus, we're going to hear about this thing called the tabernacle. Now, can you advance one? I think there's a picture there. There should be. There we go. Praise God. We're going to be talking about this thing called the tabernacle. And believe me, in our short little overview of the Bible, we cannot look at the tabernacle in the kind of detail that we really, we should. But, um, this is the tabernacle here in the desert. It's kind of a, a tent. And uh, we're going to see that the court, the border, the tent itself, the furnishings, the divisions within that tent, all those things are laid out in spectacular, intricate detail. And they all mean something. And we're not going to get into every little nuance, but I tell you, it would be worth your while to get a good book on the topic and, and check it out for yourself, okay? In particular, we do want to talk about this other thing, this piece of furniture in the tabernacle today. This is called the Ark of the Covenant, a, a golden chest into which the commandments of God were placed. And then the chest itself was put into the tabernacle, into the special place, the special chamber called the Holiest of Holies where the presence of God would dwell in a very, very significant, spectacular, and special way. We want to talk about that this morning. It, it, this tabernacle points to something. It's very, very important. In fact, the Bible donates 50, 50, 
50 chapters to the tabernacle. And when's the last time you thought about the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness? Probably not, not that often. And yet 50 chapters donated to it. It's very important. The Bible tells us what materials were to be used, what kind of furniture was going to go into that tabernacle and the precincts around it. Uh, it describes in detail the sacrificial system. You remember, they're killing animals and, sh and doing special things to the animals, all kinds of ceremonies with those animals and with the blood of the animals. And there's a priesthood that, it, that superintends all this. And there's a high priest that goes into that tabernacle, into the holiest of holies, to stand before the Ark of the Covenant once a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that all means something to us. It's, we don't do it anymore. The Jews don't do it. We don't do it. Jeremiah 3.16 says the Ark is gone now. And nevertheless, the teachings on it are important to us, even as New Testament Christians. These are very important things. So we want to look at these things. Please go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. We want to look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, because here we're getting a New Testament inspired commentary on the things we're going to be thinking about this morning. And it's always good to get God's own commentary on what he's written. You, see, you can't go wrong then, right? Isn't that correct? I mean, you pick up a Bible commentary written by some person, it might be trustworthy, it might not be, you've got to check them out, compare scripture with scripture yourself. But when God comments on biblical truths, uh, you're on solid ground. Okay, so let's take a look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. And I'm just going to read through this here. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest. Now he's speaking about Jesus here. We have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. We're getting a little hint here that the tabernacle on earth, this tent here, is a shadow, it's a type, it's a, it's a symbol, it's pointing to something greater than, than itself. Okay? A minister of the, verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, that's Jesus, also have something to offer, namely his own blood. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Why not? Why wouldn't Jesus be a priest on the earth? Well, first of all, he's not from the right tribe. He's from the tribe of Judah. He's not from the tribe of Levi. We'll see that. Uh, but look now, the, the key verse here is verse 5. Uh, These things serve uh, as the copy and the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in so much as he is also a mediator or the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for a second. You understand this, friends? There was a, a covenant between God and man there at Mount Sinai. And it all hinged on this thing called the law and Israel was to remain obedient to this law. And of course they couldn't. They didn't have it in themselves, and neither do we. And so when God, of course, seeing this, promised a better covenant, a new covenant. And when we finally get the message, we're going we're, we're to come to ourselves, and we're going to say, God, I think I like this new covenant. And this covenant is a covenant you made between yourself and us, and you tell us if we will believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross, then we will repent, and we will accept him as Lord and Savior. You, the, you will save us. You'll make us new creatures. You'll secure a home in heaven for us. You'll wash us clean. That is a better covenant. That's a way better covenant, isn't, isn't it? Way better than trying to earn your way to heaven. It, can, it just can't be done. Look at verse 8 now. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. And we get a long quotation here from the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. See, this new covenant that we're talking about as Christians, uh, in some sense, it's not really a new thing. The Old Testament looked ahead to it. Jeremiah knew all about it. 
Ezekiel 11 kind of talks about it too. The new birth. God says, I will take that stony heart from you, from you and I will, I will replace it. I will give you a heart of flesh. That's the new birth. That's why Nicodemus in John 3 uh, should have known better when Jesus told Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And he said, how can a man be born when he's old? And Jesus said, are you not a master in Israel and you don't know these things? Have you not read the prophet Ezekiel? Haven't you read Jeremiah? A new covenant. Look down, please, at verse 13. Well, look at verse 12 first. The end of the quotation here. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and, it, and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. And we say, thank you, Lord. Verse 13. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the, the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And, and I'll just say it again because there are many Christians who need to hear it. Friends, we're not under that Mosaic covenant law anymore. It's been set aside now. We are new covenant priests as Christians. But that key verse there we want to zoom in on is that fifth verse. The tabernacle, the priesthood, the sacrifices, they were all shadows and types of heavenly realities, spiritual realities. The ideal, you remember what the ideal was? The ideal was God dwelling with man in love relationship. God created a world in which that was a reality. There was God, and there was Adam and Eve, and, and there was a very good world there that God created. Paradise in the Garden of Eden. And of course, that was totally smashed and destroyed because of man's willful rebellion. We call that sin. And the only hope of any reconciliation and restoration is through the finished work of Jesus. Jesus says I, that his cross will will wash you clean and, and you'll be forgiven. But friends, it goes much more than that. You're, you're declared righteous, yes, but God promises a restoration. In the future, there'll, there'll come a time, friends, when God and man will dwell together again. And this tabernacle here, it's a little shadow and type of that. It's God saying, I'm going to dwell with you. It's a little incremental move kind of back to that, you see? And the heart of that tabernacle program was blood sacrifice. You don't go into that Holy of Holies, you don't approach God who dwells there, unless you make atonement, blood atonement, okay? Now I'm reading from Leviticus chapter 17. This is what, what uh, Moses was given by God. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Remember, the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why Jesus had to shed his blood to pay our sin debt on the cross. And the whole sacrificial system there surrounding the tabernacle, it, it's supposed to point us to these infinitely important realities. Are we kind of getting the picture here a little bit? By the time Jesus arrived on the scene, the Jewish nation should have recognized him, should have recognized his person, and his ministry, what he was coming to do. And of course, they completely missed it, didn't they? We look back with hindsight 2020. So easy for us now. But these are important truths, and we need to think about them. So go back now to the book of Exodus, chapter 25. Exodus 25, and you'll notice that we've skipped a few chapters, haven't we? You can, you can on your own time, uh, go back and look at some of those chapters there, chapter 21, 2, 3, and 4. Look at some of those civil laws. But in chapter 25 now, we're going to get some instructions on this tabernacle. Okay, you ready? Chapter 25, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly from his heart, and you shall take my offering. Right off the bat, look at this. You, you understand that we're not puppets on strings now, don't you? God has given man this gift called self-determination. God has that by nature. God freely chooses to do things. God, in fact, can do anything his holy will desires. And he has given man a measure of self-determination. You make real choices. You're not a puppet on a string. God doesn't manipulate you like some kind of marionette. Because you are free to make choices, you know what you're also free to do? You're free to love another now. Puppets can't do that. This is what it's always been about, friends. It's always been about 
God wanting you to love him. It's not like he was lacking in love, like he really needs your love. It's our, it's our pleasure to love him. It's a blessing to us to love him. If no human being loved God, guess what? He would not be impoverished. God has existed as a triune God from all eternity. There's been love relationship from all eternity. Nevertheless, God created humankind, it seems, to bless the creature with love relationship. And I, I, best I can tell, that just can't happen with robots. You see that? Now, it's kind of a curse, too, because we freely choose to do stupid things, don't we? And we do things we regret for now. The time is coming when we will be confirmed in holiness and we'll make right choices all the time, every time. On this side of heaven, we make dumb choices. But nevertheless, we have freedom, and with that freedom, we can love. And I, I recommend that we love God, <laughs> the ultimate worthy being. But notice the, uh, that they are to uh, offer sacrifice willingly from the heart. And this, this reality, this extends straight through to our own day. And Paul told the Romans, and by extension, he tells us too, you're to offer your body a what? a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service there, that term, act of worship. But look at some of the things that he's to take from the people that they're to offer willingly. In verse 3, we see they're to take uh, gold. They're supposed to give their gold. And in verse 7, onyx stones, gold and onyx for the tabernacle, for its furnishing, for its construction, furniture. In Numbers 3.38, we read that that tabernacle is to be entered from the east and that there are cherubim in proximity to that tabernacle. Ta cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, cherubim woven into the curtains, angelic beings represented there in the tabernacle. And you say, what is the significance of all this? Well, it's very significant. The tabernacle is an incremental move to that place where God and man dwell together in love relationship just like the Garden of Eden. Now, in the Garden of Eden, remember Genesis 2.10, guess what's there in proximity to the garden? Gold and onyx and cherubim. Also, the, the uh, Garden of Eden was entered from the east. That's why God stationed cherubim there on the east side of the garden to guard it. No coming back here, Adam, to eat from the tree of life. So the tabernacle is a shadow, a type, a symbol of that original perfect creation in Eden, when God and man dwelled together, tabernacled together, it's also an incremental move back to that ideal. You've seen that? When Jesus came to the earth, when he adopted a human nature, and this is described for us, isn't it? John chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, John uses a very interesting term there. He says that, the, that Jesus tabernacled with us. It's another incremental move back to the ideal. Now God is dwelling with man. See that? In the person of his son, Jesus. The ultimate realization of this is in the future yet. Revelation 21. And John sees it. And that beloved disciple sees this holy city coming out of heaven, adorned like a bride for her husband. New Jerusalem. And he hears a voice from heaven. Tabernacle of God is with man. We need to get hand on this. We've got to get a handle on this. I remember Martin and I, we went to uh, this meeting, a bunch of atheists in a room, and they had some guy from Oregon Skyped in to give a lecture to these atheists who were just willing to hear how brilliant they were and how stupid Christians were. And this, this man's claim to fame was he wrote a book. And the book was called A Manual for Making Atheists. And this man apparently goes into churches and he deconverts people and makes atheists. I thought that was very interesting. I, I told one of the ladies there I, that the, the whole premise of that book seems to confirm what the Bible says. Namely, that people need to be made atheists. We're not born that way. We're born believers. We all have a, a sense of God. You need, to be convert, you need to be brainwashed into not thinking there's a God, or into thinking there's no God. You get my meaning there. But you know what this man said? This is very interesting. And Martin caught on to it, and so did I. He made, he made a really big point of this. He says, as atheists, we have nothing to offer people. N nothing significant when you compare it to the Christian claim 
that if you, if you believe in Jesus, you'll spend eternity with a perfect being. He caught on to that. Most, most Christians don't get it. We think of streets of gold, and we think of having fun, and we think of seeing our dead relatives that we love, and, and those are all very wonderful things, yes. But when you think about spending eternity with God, and the tabernacle of God is with man, that puts everything else into the shadows. And this atheist caught it. He got that. Isn't that amazing? A, a, a being who is omnibenevolent, he only loves you. And he's omnipotent. Not only does he love you, he has the power to, in, to make sure that you have what you need and what you will enjoy. And he knows because he is omniscient. He knows all. He's not limited in any of his perfections. He's unlimited in all his perfections. And you get to spend eternity with him, and he will show you great and marvelous things, and he will love you with a perfect love, and you will love him back, and with him dwells the fullness of joy forever. That's why the, the tabernacle of God being with man is so important. That's what the Bible's all about. You know what the, what's the Bible about? It's about that. Man and God living together, dwelling together in love relationship. And the atheist, the card-carrying, flag-waving atheist got it. He saw the significance, and he says, we have nothing to offer that compares with that. Isn't that amazing? And that's why I get a little choked when I think about it. There's lots of goodness in this world. There's lots of goodness in my life still. I love my children. I love my wife. I love the things the Lord has me doing. Yes, but when I think about dwelling with Jesus, doesn't it put so other things into the shadows? Doesn't it do that for you too? You say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us. And we're just vessels of clay. Well, you just stand back and watch out what God can do with simple vessels of clay. He can get glory out of them. He can bless them in love relationship. So Jesus comes to the earth, and it's another little incremental move back to that ideal. The tabernacle was a shadow and type of Jesus who would make it happen. Let's zero in on this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. Well, first of all, let's go back up here. Let's take a look at verse 8. This is the central verse. I think this is on your bulletins here. Let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may dwell among them. There it is. This is it. This is what it's all about. This church is called New Life Sanctuary. That's a strange name. I remember Martin and Donna, they... We kept bumping into them everywhere we went before we began attending this church. And they said, you must come to our church. It's called New Life Sanctuary. And I thought, well, okay. <laughs> I'll get right on that. Sounds a bit wonky to me. <laughs> I didn't say that to Martin, but I thought it in my mind. And now I realize what a great name for a church. New Life Sanctuary. You know what a sanctuary is, friends? It's a holy place. It's a place that's appropriate for the Lord to dwell. This is a good place. This is where we open the Bible and we trust the Holy Spirit who wrote it to teach us. It's a place where Jesus is to be honored and glorified. And you're to be edified. We love the Lord here. Worship him in spirit and truth. and Love one another. This is a good place to be under this roof. In verse... Uh, in verse 10 now, we read about the Ark of the Covenant. I want to spend just a few minutes looking at the Ark of the Covenant, this big chest here. Let's look at it. Verse 10. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. It's a big chest. Two men could carry it. You shall overlay it with pure gold. This is verse 11. Overlay it with pure gold inside and out, and you shall overlay it. You shall make on it a molding of gold all around, and you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. Remember, you don't touch this thing. You don't touch the ark. You carry it with its poles. Verse 16, and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. Note that the law goes into the ark. 
Mo the Mosaic law goes into the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, now it gets very, very important here at verse uh, 17 now. I wonder if you're going to see, look for words that repeat here, okay? Watch out, here it comes. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. You shall make two cherubim of gold, angelic creatures, two cherubim of gold, hammered work with, uh, you shall make with them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Now twice we've heard mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, the other cherub at the other end, and you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of, of it of one piece with the mercy seat. There again, mercy seat. The cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. Their faces of the cherubim shall be towards the mercy seat. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. Okay, what have we heard seven times already? Mercy seat. And the cherubim go above the mercy seat. That's the hood of the ark, the lid. Two cherubim, and God says, I will meet you right there. That thing goes into the tabernacle, into the holiest of holies, and the high priest goes in once a year, and he applies blood to that mercy seat. And God says, I'll meet you right there. Leviticus 16, Yom Kippur. Very interesting. What are we talking about here? What is this pointing to? The book of Hebrews, you needn't turn there, but in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and verse 5, the writer of the Hebrews is, goes into some detail on the tabernacle and on the ark, and he has an interesting word for the mercy seat. He calls it the hilasterion. And that word is translated elsewhere, propitiation. The Apostle Paul in Romans 3.25 says that Jesus Christ is our propitiation. Jesus is our mercy seat. The propitiation, the hilasterion, that means he is the atoning sacrifice and he is the place where the sins are taken away. He is all those things and, and infinitely more. That, now we learn something. That Ark of the Covenant is pointing to Jesus. The lid there, the same word, the propitiation, the mercy seat. It's him. It points to him. Now, we know, now knowing that, that becomes very interesting. Now we know what to look for as we look at the Ark's construction. Notice that the Ark is made of what kind of wood? Do you have it there? Acacia wood, verse 10. Acacia wood and overlaid with pure gold. What's acacia wood? Where does that come from? That's a special kind of tree. Acacia wood lives in the desert. It lives in very, very dry climates. Furthermore, acacia wood is virtually incorruptible. It doesn't rot real easy. It's wonderful for con constructing things. Furniture, beautiful wood that doesn't rot. And it grows in these dry climates. Now, who does that remind you of? Listen, listen, please, to Isaiah 53 and verse 2. Remember Isaiah 53, the, the greatest exposition of the Lord's atoning work on the cross in all of the Old Testament. Isaiah 53. I mean, it's a central chapter. You, mean, you read Isaiah 53, you think you're reading New Testament. Isaiah 53, verse 2, speaking of the suffering servant. Quote, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. That, that speaks of virgin birth, too, doesn't it? Roots don't normally grow out of dry ground. But the acacia tree does, overlaid with pure gold. Here we have one article of furniture for the tabernacle made of two very distinct substances, one kind of common, the other not. One wooden, the other golden. I think the ark right there is speaking of the two natures of Jesus. Dan and I were just discussing this. One person with two natures, a human nature, and in his human nature, what? Incorruptible. His body did not see corruption in the grave. His divine nature represented by the pure gold overlaid inside and out. So the two natures there represented by the ark's uh, construction, its materials, and of course its function, its mercy seat, the place where atonement is made, the blood applied to the, heart, to the ark. Remember verse 22. Notice verse 22 there. God says, I will meet you there, 
and I will speak to you from above the mercy seat between those two cherubim. Now, can you see them? I wonder if you can see that. It's kind of light, but on the ark, you've got two angelic beings with their wings stretching toward each other. They're facing each other on, on the lid of the ark. God says, I'll meet you right there between them on the mercy seat. Well, in the garden, uh, guess what? Jesus comes walking into the garden after mankind has sinned, the pre-incarnate Christ, and he pronounces judgment, and he casts original man and his wife out of the garden, and guess who's there? Two cherubim. I suggest that they were flanking him as he walked through the garden. Maybe, maybe not, but one thing's for sure. In Genesis 18, there he was flanked with two angels. Two angelic beings walked beside the Lord Jesus as he approached Abraham and had dinner together. In John chapter 20, when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, she looked inside the tomb of Jesus. His body was gone, but guess who was there? Two angels sitting where? One at the head, one at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, the mercy seat. At his ascension, guess who showed up? Two angels to, com to comfort and educate those bewildered disciples when they saw the Lord going to heaven. There they were to say, don't stand there gazing into heaven. He's coming back. And, you know, get on with the work he's, <laughs> he's given you to do. Guess what? When the Lord returns, he returns in the glory of the angels. Can you see Jesus there in that little piece of furniture called the Ark of the Covenant? I hope you see him there. The main point we want to think about right now is that the law went into that ark. The law of Moses that we never could have kept, we didn't keep, impossible for us to keep, that went into that ark. And then that ark went into the holiest of holies. And God would look down from heaven at that broken law sitting in the ark of the covenant, that law that only condemns us, it can't save us. The law condemns. The strength of sin is the law. That law prescribes for us what we ought to be doing, and we can't do it. We don't do it. God looks down at that condemning law from heaven. Oh, but guess what? There's something that's going to stand between God and that broken law. What is it? The blood. The blood offered by the high priest. You know, today, friends, it's not the blood of bulls and goats and calves that do anything for us. You know that, right? It wasn't by the, with the blood of goats and bulls that Jesus entered into the tabernacle in, in the third heaven. He offered his own blood there. And if you're a Christian, when God looks at you, and somehow, some way, in his mysterious wisdom and love, he doesn't see your sin. He sees through the blood of Jesus now. And, you get, and you're declared righteous. Do you feel righteous all the time? Do you always feel holy? Do you always feel clean? Do you always feel pure? I don't. Not always. Well, friends, there's an infinite difference between state and standing. Get that down. In your state right now, you're sinful. Me too. In our flesh dwells no good thing, says Paul. Oh, but you have a standing before God based on the finished work of Jesus. He looks at you through the blood. And he passes over you, just like at the Passover. Remember that, Exodus 12? God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over that house for judgment. You see how important the tabernacle is? How, how important the ark is? How important all these ceremonies and rituals and priesthoods and all of it? I mean, it's all pointing to Jesus. I mean, you kind of get the picture here that Jesus Christ is the grand unifying theme of the Bible. Are you getting it? And I'll tell you something else. He is the centerpiece of world history, universal history, human history. He's the centerpiece of it all. He's the mediator of a better covenant. That's what the Bible's all about. What he did, who he is, what his work was, what it consists of, his obedience to death, humbling himself even to the death of the cross. And week by week, we think about that. We ought to be thinking about it. I'd like you to turn, please, to 1 Peter chapter 2. It will finish with 1 Peter 2. I won't go beyond what I've prepared here. Even if we finish a little early, you don't need me to just keep talking. <laughs> Let's get the message from God, and then, John, you be quiet. 
But let's go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. You have it there? Now let's get the picture again. A perfect world is created by God. Man and God dwelling in love relationship harmoniously. Smashed and destroyed by sin. A schism, a chasm now. And reconciliation is needed. And so with the priesthood in Israel and the, the tabernacle and the sacrifices, we get an incremental move back to the place where God and, and man can dwell together. And Jesus comes to the earth 2,000 years ago to pay our sin debt and to, to open the way to himself. And he's moving us back to that place where all the redeemed will dwell with God. The tabernacle of God will be with men. Oh, but right now, friends, even right now, we have moved even closer to that time when God and man will dwell together. Even closer than what Moses enjoyed and what the children of Israel enjoyed in Old Testament times. Okay, now look at it, please. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. This is us now, okay? 1 Peter 2, 4. Coming to him as to a living stone, that's Jesus, the living stone, the chief cornerstone, Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up, offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now get the picture here. You and I, together, and believers worldwide, are being put together into a different kind of tabernacle, a house, a spiritual house, a temple for God to dwell in. So individually and collectively, the Spirit of God dwells in us and operates through us. In a sense, the tabernacle of God is already with man, in some sense. You, you're not your own. Paul says it. You, you were bought with a price. And your body is a temple of, of God now. And together, we're being built up into this spiritual house to do what? to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Jesus has done everything for us. He is so wonderful. He is so great. He does all things well. You offer up feeble prayers, and I do too. Feeble, half-hearted sometimes. Our praises are always tainted. We offer up these kind of prayers to God. And yet, the Bible it says here, they're made acceptable through Jesus. He takes your prayers and makes them acceptable. He made you acceptable. You are acceptable in the beloved one, Paul says. It's, it's not what you know, friends. It's who you know. In the high courts of heaven, we know Jesus. He makes the way back to God. It, this is our real problem. This is our, this is our infinite problem. How does a right relationship get reestablished between sinful men and a holy God. This is the constant theme in the book of Job. Read the book of Job sometime. It, it's, it constantly comes up. How can a man born of woman be pure? How can a man be righteous before God? I mean, it's, this has been in, in man's mind since the beginning. And Job and his friends wrestled with it. God says, oh, I have, I have the solution here. It's called the virgin birth of my beloved son. That's how a man born of woman can be pure. And because of his sinless person, in his atoning work, the, may, the way is made. And the chasm is bridged between a holy God and sinful men. And that's what we're to think about. Week by week, moment by moment, we're to think about these awesome truths. Order our lives in accordance with them. Not easy. No one said it was easy. It's not. But God doesn't drop us. Aren't you happy about that? You didn't do anything to earn your salvation, and you're not doing anything to keep it. It's a work of God. Why? Because he's just that wonderful. And he loves you. And he loves me. We need to hear that God loves us. In a world full of hate and selfishness and self-seeking and just plain wickedness, I like to hear that the God of eternity who dwells in the third heaven loves me. And he loves you too. And he won't drop you. Wow. Well, these are awesome truths. I think I'm going to stop right there. Let's have a word of prayer together, and, and we'll offer up one more song of praise to God. Gracious Father, we thank you for your love, grace, and mercy.
Thank you this morning, Lord, for confronting us with these awesome truths uh, from your holy word. Thank you, Jesus, glorious, awesome centerpiece of world history, the centerpiece of the Holy Bible. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, grace, and mercy. Thank you for your promise to complete the work that you began in every one of us. We thank you, God, for these wonderful promises. Help us, dear Lord, to move along this road called sanctification. Help us to love, honor, and serve you in greater measure, moment by moment, dear Father. We ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen and amen. All right. All right. God bless you all. <laughs>